And here's the redo. The initial setup of the board with the German attacks about to begin. Here on turn one, game three, 2015. Now halfway through turn one of the game, Japan has once again tried a let's take China strategy. Uh, changing it up a little bit this time, saving one carrier group uh, for the Japanese mainland instead of sending all three to the Philippines. But hey, we still got two down here, so uh, work was still done in that regard. Taking Borneo this time, if they will believe he did that last time, instead of Malaya. Um, and Yunnan was attacked this turn as well, which is a, a change up. Obviously, an important territory. Um, for the Chinese to hold and undoubtedly they'll come back for it. We have the Russian troops up there. Which way will they go? And this time we have a few additional Russian troops on their way over towards the China coast. Now here on this side Russia's done the build-up that it expects to do on this turn but Germany signaling a different strategy and leaving all of this southern flank open not sending infantry towards Russia, but rather this time uh, making no uh, bones about its intention or interest in doing a London first strategy. Now, the devastating Taranto raid of the last game kind of informs this strategy. I think Chris uh, wants to tell the UK that if he loses all those planes, sends them down to the Med, that there will be consequences to pay the next turn in London. And I've run the odds on the Axis calculator, and I believe he'll be right. So, will the UK make that maneuver here on the rest of turn one? Well, we've completed turn one of game three in 2015. And uh, we've got the hang of this by now. The first moves were largely similar to what they were before. U.S. spending all its money in the Pacific to... Uh, beef up what's here in Hawaii. A few different change-ups. Japan left uh, quite a bit more back in Japan this time. Um, as I mentioned, hit the Yunnan. UK in uh, China. China hitting back, taking, uh, taking that one strong in Yunnan. Uh, India buying a, guy in a couple guys in a plane uh, as before. Uh, but and moving over to take Persia as normal, but wow, the big uh, difference here, look at all that brown. So uh, we did the Taranto raid again, and um, the odds were a, a little bit more balanced because due to Germany's uh, intimidation of London, avoided bringing all of the planes down from London like I did before. I only sent one plane to be supplemented by the one in Gibraltar back home, but you know, sent everything else that could, including the plane to Malta, which means I didn't send the cruiser into Malta, um, but sent everything else that could into the Adriatic Sea Zone. And just as poorly as uh, Chris rolled in the last game, I rolled in this game. The Allies, I think, scored what, a total of one hit? One hit. One hit out of two rounds of combat. The first one, the first round, was a complete loss. Zero hits. Three planes scrambled. Uh, the only hit taken by Italy in that raid was a dent to the battleship, which of course is quickly fixed. Uh, UK finally got out of there uh, with a plane after um, one, after that second round of combat. The only thing that lived. As a result, Italy survived until its turn with three different navies. Took out the French, which was supplemented by that cruiser, which in retrospect I should have just retreated. Um, and then obviously brought everything else to Alexandria, just waiting to pounce on Egypt in turn two. Germany intimidating London still. We'll see what they do here in the next turn. Halfway through turn two, we see that the U.S. has... Uh, done its thing in Hawaii and it's about ready to do another thing. Uh, Japan has left quite a bit back in the homeland giving the Americans pause before they get too adventurous. 
while at the same time splitting his forces down south to take all of the money islands in one turn, giving himself an ungodly bonus while pressing forward through China with, uh, with great speed. Quite a few uh, air units there in Vietnam getting ready to tackle Yunnan, while uh, the Chinese plane up north has been eliminated as well. India turtling um, Italy, just uh, unbelievable what they're about to do uh, here in Egypt. Uh, Russia built up, Germany built up, Germany decided to stop threatening London and rather build 11 or so guys in Germany with some tanks to boot. Uh, brought its navy down south to kill the American fighter in Gibraltar and pose a threat to the American mainland, which America now has to deal with. Alright, we've just completed turn two. See the uh, U.S. following a familiar pattern of Moving stuff down to Hawaii while dropping a blocker uh, to keep them safe. And uh, sending the rest down here to Anzac. Anzac, which uh, just bought itself a carrier and uh, helped out by taking a unguarded transport out of the way. India has uh, turtled itself a bit but uh, sent its navy to do something rather unconventional. So Italy was knocking on Egypt's door with... 100% chance of victory. So rather than just facing glorious annihilation, the uh, UK forces down here pulled back uh, as much as possible, leaving everybody but the Anzac guys taking out Iraq and buying themselves a factory in Persia. Now um, we'll see if that yet gets overrun. We've had bad experiences with Middle East factories in the past. However, um, They've got a little bit of breathing room, try and uh, beef that up and keep it protected. We'll see what the Italians uh, and such want to do. But for the meantime, uh, Italians pretty much own most of Africa and uh, not a whole lot of challenge to their domination in the meantime. Uh, UK has uh, dug in in the UK Isles there, the British Isles, but not doing anything offensive yet, while the US this turn spends its money in the Atlantic, facing off against an ungodly German fleet in Gibraltar on round three. Halfway through turn three, having just completed Japan's turn, uh, Chris has continued the momentum as Japan should do, bringing down the home fleet there to the Philippines to guard the rear while the forward fleet and land units continue their push through Asia. You see an enormous win here in Yunnan having defeated all 16 infantry in one plane on the first turn uh, in light of that enormous air force there in Vietnam. Uh, India seeing them knocking on the door while Russia positioning itself for the German invasion, but not having been invaded yet. So we'll be waiting for, for turn four for that to happen. But the Germans on their turn, just building up that infantry, marching forward while uh, sliding their fleet here into the Mediterranean. We'll see what happens on the rest of turn three. It's the end of turn three, and it's hard to believe that it's that early in the game since so much has happened. So since the last installment, the U.S. has completed its push to Australia with the uh, Anzac folks uh, moving up their carrier, buying some transports to fill in that Navy. U.S almost jumping on those money islands with uh, some throwaway transports, deciding not to, and frankly it's be only because I realized he has two transports right there rather than just one that are in reach and could have took them both back. Um, India, just buying some guys. UK though, UK Europe, all in on the Persian factory strategy, uh, building up some infantry as well as 
some subs down here in South Africa, so making its presence felt in the Indian Ocean, kind of round two of the European battle. Uh, Italy doing as Italy should do, uh, gradually expanding out its land presence in its supply lines so as not to overextend oneself. Uh, capturing its North Africa bonus, so it's getting plus 15 a turn now. And its Mediterranean Navy threatening, but not yet committing to go into the Red Sea. U.S. withholding itself uh, from launching out the Atlantic one more turn, but uh, spent all its money here on this side of the board again, uh, filling up its Navy. And uh, we'll see how Germany reacts and how it will plunge into Russia here on turn four. Halfway through turn four, having just completed Japan's turn, you see that Japan has purchased some transports and land units there up in the homeland, building nothing on the coast because he doesn't have to. Um, so Japan's taken Malaya, Burma, parked a whole bunch of land units here on the border of India, and then turned the entire navy around parking them all in the Philippines because he knows he has India in the bag. So he's going to make me wonder now which of the last remaining victory cities he's after. Um, Russia, on the other hand, um, got attacked, got attacked here in uh, the Baltic states. And that was taken because there's only one guy defending. And Russia has... Uh, piled everything it has into the factory up there and defending down in the south as well. You see we got bombed down in Ukraine and didn't fix that. Germany just continuing the conga line of troops all the way up the northern coast and uh, fully committed himself now to that Russian invasion. So the Allies are going to have their hands full here on turn four. And here we have at the end of turn four, the U.S. chose to build all its builds in the Pacific this time around to back up against the threatening Japanese horde, otherwise holding fast uh, down in Australia, other than uh, to punch out some uh, transports here and double up on these money islands. Japan, as we know, is knocking on India's door. India building a couple land units, kind of waiting for the dice to roll. All that's left there. Uh, India, the other end of the Indian Ocean, the UK, Europe folks uh, went in and took Transjordan, only for the Italians to take it back with force, leaving quite a few guys there. Uh, the UK building up uh, more Navy, or at least positioning more Navy, and building a Strat bomber and some other uh, units there in the Persian Gulf, investing all their cash over there. The uh, Americans also pounced with their Atlantic Navy, took both Gibraltar and Morocco, threatening to cost Italy some bonuses, so Italy chose to double back its Mediterranean Navy, fling it to the other side. And I will note here that I realized only slightly too late that what I really should have done with my UK tactical bomber over here was take out the naval base so that that was no longer an option for Italy, but live and learn. Um, of course, I should have also built a destroyer here in the UK so I'd stop bleeding out IPCs to this stupid sub, which has more than paid for itself by now. Um, otherwise... With the Atlantic wide open and the Mediterranean now uh, flinging back and forth, interesting things will happen on turn five. Oh, neglected to point out that uh, this battle is the first to uh, resolve here on turn five. Now halfway through turn five, having just completed Japan's turn, he's built uh, some subs as a backstop there in Tokyo. Otherwise, moving the entire naval fleet here down to 
Java, where he's retaken the two money islands that the U.S. had occupied, committing his navy uh, wholly down there now. As expected, uh, India fell to the Japanese. Um, you know, the, the defenders did their part, but ultimately there's a whole lot left there to deal with. Um, interesting move here, uh, unexpected, but uh, Germany pulled its navy through the Suez and not only took Persia, but somehow fended itself off, that lone tank fended itself off from three mechanized infantry that came down from Russia, from the Caucasus. Um, knowing that they were attacking on a one, but the odds calculator said there's something like an 86% chance of victory there, and yet they fell. So the UK finds itself sandwiched in Iraq with uh, a whole mess of dudes coming at them from India. So this is going to be interesting. Italy, um, as you know, is over here. And uh, Germany opting not to attack up in the Baltic states, but rather pull its forces together, reinforce that line a little bit, and uh, build a whole lot of ground units in Europe proper, anticipating a potential allied invasion from this American fleet. Russia building up three planes in, in uh, Leningrad to maximize its defense value, uh, and also pulling some guys here into Bessarabia to create a second front for Germany to be concerned about on round five. And at the end of turn five, it looks like this. The U.S. brought some Navy down to Hawaii to reinforce there. Otherwise, continuing to build up here in Australia. Anzac itself has bought land units and put all of its naval units into place. The UK in the Middle East, uh, all things considered, had some good roles. Took back Persia, uh, having invaded with its navy from down south. Uh, a bit of a tussle in the naval zone, but with the plane having nowhere to land and the sub having scored a hit on one of the transports, navy uh, pulled back, let the plane die, and let the transport live. Uh, also had some good rolling here, which frankly was better than odds in Jordan, taking out what was uh, left of the Italian force, while at the same time the U.S. executing on its strategy to destroy the Italian Navy in 92 with all of its subs and planes. Again, that one went better than odds, and Italy has responded by building up a new Navy with all of its crazy bonuses that it's still collecting. U.S. then moving all of its Navy to the U.K. sea zone, where the uh, U.K. has taken advantage of that opportunity to finally build its own transports, posing a threat of invasion here on round six. Now halfway through turn six, having just completed Japan's turn, it has spent its money and units wisely. It's now uh, built up beginnings of a navy in Japan with another carrier and planes. These transports have been busy shucking dudes around Asia, finally tripping the Mongolian tripwire and activating those guys as Japan commences gobbling up northern Russia. Still making a push into China, getting a little bit stymied in a couple of those battles. A little bit of Chinese remnant going on. A slow push through India, having now wiped India off the IPC map and built a new carrier there in uh, the Indian Ocean to uh, cement its gains. And Japan now ranks at 80 on the IPC chart with its plus 10 bonus. Ridiculous. Uh, Russia and Germany have had some conflagration this turn. Um, Germany opting to push its huge army forward out of the Baltic states rather than engaging in Leningrad and uh, moving another large uh, contingent into eastern Poland from Poland proper. Um, Russia responding by moving all its units up from Bessarabia, taking eastern Poland, um, but of course leaving a gap there 
that these uh, Russians now are going to be, or Germans rather, are going to be tempted to fill on the next turn. So how will the U.S. and the rest of the Allies respond on turn six? And at the end of turn six, the Allies have responded thusly. Uh, U.S. pouring all of its money into subs and a couple destroyers, almost all of them in the Pacific. You'll see a couple in the Atlantic as well. Flying the planes down to Hawaii and the Navy reinforcing the huge agglomeration that continues to accrue in Australia. Two of those Australian transports have gone and again made nuisances of themselves, getting uh, as much value as they can out of these uh, targets here, uh, getting Australia's bonus for another round. Japan inexorably moving across South Asia towards Persia, tussling with the Chinese, and finally activating Mongolia as it uh, proceeds to gobble up northern Russia. The Russians reinforcing uh, the Persian uh, contingent down here, turtling rather than uh, trying to uh, take Egypt, which it would have only lost, and uh, piling up what's left down here in Africa. Italy has invested itself in moving forward back towards the Middle East, while uh, continuing to very successfully bomb the UK. U.S. Uh, considered a few options, but ultimately stuck with its original strategy of taking Norway and then the U.K. backing it up here. So we'll see how they march forward here on turn seven. Halfway through turn seven, having just completed Japan's round, Japan is moving ever so inexorably forward, having now started to gobble up Mongolia. A little bit more of China and moving all available units to the border of Persia while also bombing that factory there. The Italians of course are poised to come in from the other side. Russia and Germany had a bit more of a tussle. Uh, Germany consolidated all of its forward units into eastern Poland where it easily uh, eradicated the Russians there, pulling them back, of course, a little bit from the front line after uh, Russia snapped up a couple of those undefended territories, but uh, still quite a few German dudes there for the Allies to deal with here on round seven. And on the end of turn seven, we see a little shake up in the order of things. Um, most notably, we finally have some action in the South Pacific. Anzac uh, saw an opportunity, broke out with uh, a portion of its navy here, took out Japan's only destroyer in this vicinity outside the Philippines, and also uh, four of its transports, which were left stranded here in the islands. The only way it could reach them was to send a carrier to catch the planes that killed them and uh, a sub to kill the destroyer. So we have uh, pulled the plug on this one. We'll see if, uh, if Japan responds or holds back. But in the meantime, Japan inexorably moving forward uh, to the Middle East. We see that uh, the UK, after much deliberation, chose to retreat from Persia and uh, had two ways it could go. It could have taken out the Italians in Transjordan or uh, tried to plug the hole in Caucasus after uh, a long time decided to go the latter route uh, while also building some units down here, not wholly giving up on Africa, but uh, pretty much leaving Persia to its fate. At the same time, the Americans proceeded with their, uh, what is now typical strategy, in building a factory uh, that is now burning in Norway with the UK reinforcing it with land units. And uh, after seven turns, has finally cleared the Atlantic of U-boats as well. Uh, we'll see what shakes out on turn eight. Now halfway through turn eight, and yes, those are Japanese in Alaska. 
with nary an American unit on this side of the board. So caught the U.S. a little bit with his pants down and an intentional second front to try and delay the advance of the Americans. And um, as predicted, we see that popping the cork on the Anzac American fleet caused the Japanese to invade. All things being considered, the Allies didn't do terribly in defending themselves. I'd say each side had average roles, and frankly, I think the Japanese had a bit of above average role on some of those. Um, nevertheless, there is an Anzac and an American second strike capability, so we'll see how that shakes out on the rest of the turn. Um, the Japanese also taking out that uh, rogue Australian carrier that started the whole conflagration. Um, Japanese making a slight change of plans here, taking Persia with only one guy, but then shooting everything else up to Turkmenistan, where the uh, resistance was a bit lower. Italians, of course, having taken Iraq, and the UK still pondering what it's going to do about that. There was uh, some action in Russia in the first half of this turn. All the Germans pouring everything they've got into western Ukraine, abandoning their quest for uh, Leningrad, coming down to Ukraine and Volgograd instead, and uh, doing a mighty fine job of it. Once again, the defending Russians realizing that they had no hope of victory, especially with the uh, Italian backup forces there, um, instead compiling all their guys in Bryansk, to uh, even pulling down from Russia to create a wall of resistance there. We've got five American bombers waiting to come over, but will they all come over here on turn eight in light of the Japanese developments? We shall see. And at the end of turn eight, we find that the Americans redirected their bombers in order to rid themselves of this Japanese infestation in Alaska and spent a turn's worth of builds here in the Pacific instead of where they could have done it in Norway. So that was an effective move on Japan's part to at least slow the uh, Americans' roll towards Germany. However, after a full turn of naval conflagration, uh, we see that the Allies, at least for the time being, have the upper hand because, you know, they have some surviving surface warships and the Japanese do not. Um, that's not saying a whole lot, though, because they do get 80-something IPCs per turn uh, with bonuses. So, still a formidable foe, to be sure. They've uh, just about finished gobbling up China. There's always one more guy that seems to pop up. Um, the Italians took Iraq and Persia. Uh, Frenchmen took it, took Iraq back, but we'll see how long that lasts. So they're piling up some guys here in Egypt and buying all infantry on the mainland, marching them steadily towards the Russian front to help out their flailing German brethren. You'll see that the uh, Italians consolidated some forces there in eastern Poland. Certainly now a force to be reckoned with on their own merits. The British and Americans continue piling guys in through Norway. You see a fair number of dudes coming down that way. And uh, fun awaits on turn nine. In the middle of turn nine, just completed Japan's turn, and Japan is getting so much money, it's flipped the chart. It's getting a total of 91 with bonuses. You'll see that it spent almost all of that money rebuilding its navy that was sunk last turn. Quite an arsenal there already uh, in one turn's build. Japan's completed gobbling up. Most of Asia, one Chinese territory left. Whole lot of dudes built up there in Kazakhstan. Persia has flipped hands so many times. Russia actually took it back uh, from the Italians 
this uh, turn and Japan turned around took it back from them so not often you see an exchange like that Italy poised to do something or other uh, Russia decided to send its uh, northern armies forward into eastern Poland took out the sizable Italian contingent that was there and did it quite handily uh, giving some pressure now on the Germans who are realizing that even their second strike capability may not be enough and uh, building up this force here you'll see that is 30 40 infantry um, knocking on Ukraine's door we'll see what uh, Germany does in response to that and now it's time for the rest of the Allies to chip in here on turn 9. Well how did the Allies respond on turn 9? US built uh, a few surface ships there, some subs and destroyers, uh, while bringing infantry and some air units down to Hawaii to reinforce. Anzac built uh, a couple land units and another sub, starting the naval race all over again here in the Pacific. You, the Italy forces uh, spread back out again, took Iraq back from the French, solidified their line there while continuing to march guys forward thought about engaging the uh, Russians who have now been recently reinforced by the Americans thought better of it UK uh, continuing to piddle a few guys into South Africa while shocking the rest over from London to Norway London being habitually bombed just about every turn by the uh, Italians who have one bomber left lost one I think it was last turn in the uh, Ukraine or Volgograd or something trying to bomb that got a down US this turn buying planes in Norway and to make up for the ones that it shot down to Russia which will fuel even more bloodshed here in Europe on round 10 Round 10, first half of the turn. Let's just take a look at Japan, which consists of one large ring of troops. He's got his uh, consolidated lines now on the outside of China, having gobbled up that entire country. Bit of reinforcements down here on the side in these money islands. And then the last two turns, all of his 90 plus IPCs spent on building a new navy that has now started to advance to the Philippines, where this time he has some protected transports and a bunch of land units and air support. In comparison, although Anzac and US haven't gone yet this turn, their numbers are a little bit weaker, so uh, it's going to be interesting to see how long they can last. Also this turn, Germany decided to pull back strategically from the Ukraine. Russia took the invitation and occupied it. However, all the tanks that were in Ukraine swung up joined all the infantry and planes and tanks, everything that could come from Germany into eastern Poland. You see 11 tanks that are still living. A lot to deal with for the Allies on turn 10. And at the end of turn 10, we see that the U.S. bought nine subs and a guy over here, spent the rest of its money in Norway. Built up a bit, moving its prior Navy into Hawaii, transports back to catch a new load. Anzac just continuing to uh, build up as best it can. The UK pulling back, continue to uh, drop a few guys a turn into Africa while the Italians shot their Navy over to the other side to deal with a small US sub incursion. 
bought some uh, planes and a sub, beefing up its Mediterranean presence a little bit. Pulling back from Iraq to protect Egypt, it appears. While uh, the U.S. dropped uh, a few units into Norway, dropped some bombs for the first time. The bombers are finally doing their thing. Will it be enough to slow down Germany and keep Japan from winning the game on turn 11? Halfway through turn 11, and it looks like the Pacific board may be in its death rattle uh, because all of Japan's Navy, as anticipated, has uh, gathered itself here in the Caroline Islands meaning they can strike at any time at either Sydney or Hawaii and the US and they have to be prepared for both and they just can't keep up economically with that level of development now you see that Japan's not only built that up but reinforced it with yeah that's a stack of seven strat bombers coming in to support them on the offense so I mean, Chris, I'd give him two turns uh, to build up those that bomber and then attack on the second turn and wipe out his target of choice. The uh, other end of the Japanese Empire here has walked itself forward all down the board. I mean, they're about to knock on Russia's door. Uh, the southern contingent in Persia, just happy to keep the uh, door plugged here. No ambitions of uh, churning out tanks yet out of Tehran. On the Russian front, we have a lot of jiu-jitsu going on, no real combat. All of the German forces backed up by the Italians have now snuck back up again uh, into Poland, causing the uh, Russians to counter-move. Um, but Germany is trying something new this time, bought all subs up in the Baltic Sea just to throw the U.S. off, keep them busy, and uh, we'll see how they react here on turn 11. And at the end of turn 11, it looks no less grim for the Allies. U.S. has decided to invest in planes this time around, bringing what it could down to both Hawaii and Australia waiting for the inevitable onslaught of the Japanese Navy. The UK managed to pull off an invasion of Persia, switching that country's control yet again. I think just about every country on the board has controlled that territory at one point or another. Um, Italy ignoring that and pushing down south into Egypt instead with reinforcements that were expected from the mainland. U.S. doesn't have a lot to accomplish over here. Had to pull back its navy for a couple reasons. Didn't have anybody to transport, and those subs were a pesky little threat. Um, everybody else moving around as they can up here. U.K. positioning itself as best it can. Italy plunging into the Baltic states with 10 dudes left over. And with Germany's turn just about to start here on turn 12, how will they exploit that opportunity? Halfway through turn 12, Japan's turn was just as devastating as you might have expected. See all this stuff down here left in the Australian waters. Got rid of the uh, surface ship there in Hawaii along with the transports. Building invasion fleet for the final maneuver into Sydney. Germany marched all of its 40-something infantry into the Baltic states, so Russia responded by bailing from Leningrad, consolidating there in Belarus with uh, some Brits to follow on the rest of turn 12. Okay, after due consideration here, in the middle of turn 12, the Allies are going to concede the rest of the game because Japan is inevitably going to prevail on the Pacific board. See here, this Japanese fleet, it's uh, 
it's pretty much dominating the Australian coastline at this point. All these transports right here are sitting on Guinea, which is one, two sea zones away from Sydney itself. So it's not just a matter of plowing through the reinforcements that we've got up there in Queensland. Everybody's going to pull back here to Sydney, and there's going to be one last stand off there. Now, um, it's, it's already uh, a turn or two uh, distant for U.S. to get there. It's got a fair number of subs, which, of course, are blocked by this guy. Uh, honestly, I had intended to put up my own blockers and neglected to do that. I mean, I really... I would have had to spend four destroyers in order to do that, and I didn't have that many down here to begin with, so I chose to just stand it off, but I was going to block these subs from getting there for another turn at least. And these eight planes that are sitting there, yeah, they can hop from Hawaii down to Queensland as they have been to supply uh, defense on the ground. Trouble is, uh, next turn, when Japan takes Queensland, those eight planes are going to have nowhere to land, so... The last set of planes that get in are going to be these two in Hawaii, and that's just not going to be enough. I mean, yeah, next turn, he's probably not going to take it, but turn after that he will, and in the meantime, he's convoying the crap out of Australia and just kind of strangling them to death. So we could play it out another turn or two, but there's really realistically no hope uh, for the U.S. to get in there. So... Closing thoughts from an Allied perspective, and I'll hand it over to Chris for the Axis. Um, you know, between this and the last game, where we had the uh, the same same uh, division of countries here, uh, we saw what happens when you tried a couple different of opening move strategies. So that last game, we had a really successful Toronto raid uh, here in the Adriatic, uh, to the point where Italy was just stopped up and um, had no comeback at the end of the first turn. Whereas uh, learning that lesson here, um, this time around, Germany uh, made a credible sea lion threat on turn one, uh, which uh, kept the UK from committing all of its air force to its Taranto raid. Uh, and thus that round went really badly for the allies and uh, Italy has really never looked back. It's been strong ever since. It's getting all of its bonuses, and um, you know it's it's done what it has to do. So, and you'll see, you know, you can see visually here even that uh, as the axis, Chris has done a good job at maintaining his borders here. They're very circular almost, and even here in Japan, it's a solid block of territory here and line all around. No need to staff the middle territories. As the Allies, what can I do? Well, Russia did have the advantage of having four turns to build up here because the downside of that sea line strategy is that uh, it takes Germany a little bit longer to get to Russia. Now, I kind of think he probably could have attacked sooner than turn four, but um, Chris is more conservative and it worked out well for him. Uh, nevertheless, I mean, Russia's not going to fall anytime soon. Those are 50 infantry in, uh, in Belarus there, so... You know, that's going to be a bit of a tussle, but with Italy so strong, I mean, Germany wouldn't have been able to do what it did if Italy didn't have its own fair share of troops just coming through with really no pressure on them at any other point. So, you know, why not? Um, so Russia has its hands full. Russia only maintained what it did because the UK was coming down. Now, because of that uh, horrible Taranto raid, you know, Egypt fell pretty quickly, um, but you know, UK didn't crumble at least this time as it usually does when that happens. Uh, we, be, between the guys coming up from South Africa and the Persian factory, which you know I'm kind of iffy on, but hey, yeah, it, it didn't make a big impact in the game, I wasn't turning tanks out or anything, but it was enough of a base of operations that um, it gave the Axis more resistance than I think that they were willing to uh, to put in effort to overcome. You'll notice there's, there are no Axis players in the Caucasus, which of course is a big bonus area for Germany. Um, so we were able to at least hold that off. We we kept, at the end of the game, we've, Russia's got all its victory cities still. Uh, yeah, it was about to lose one, and it did in fact lose another and take it back later, but 
you know, it, there, there's some kind of equilibrium here. Japan made it all the way here, gobbled up China, but frankly, because it had to focus on the Pacific in order to win the game, uh, this is just a holding pattern right here. Like, yeah, they're gobbling up the empty territories, but there aren't enough units here to take Russia and put up any kind of resistance if I'm able to get a second strike force here, like I would have had the game gone on longer. So if I had found a way to punch through that line, yeah, I could open up a second front and maybe give Japan something to work with. Um, U.S. strategy, it followed the script pretty much. I mean, it faltered. I don't think that's necessarily the fault of the European strategy. The, the Norway factory is, is a classic at this point, and I had some stuff I wanted to churn out in Norway. I was one turn away from doing it, and would have uh, would have made a creative use of that factory, uh, but for the fact that Japan was such a problem, I had to spend all my money in the Pacific. Never got a chance to do that, and then Germany kind of knocking back my momentum by doing crazy things like building subs and you know, me running out of IPCs actually build things there. So um, that stalled. I don't I don't think it was necessarily a bad strategy. It was kind of had to adapt to what was going on. Um, but it's it, it just shows that really strong opening move by the Axis uh, is hard to overcome. And then uh, this first turn attack, and maybe Chris will say something more about that, but I, this especially contrasted to our uh, our game two, game two games ago, the first one of this year, where I, as the Axis, chose to wait until turn four in order to benefit Germany's sea line move. Um, that just shows that that kills Japan. Uh, Japan did great here because it launched on the first turn and never looked back. And uh, the rest of the Allies were never able to keep up. That We had a stalemate down here in Australia for a long time, but that wasn't stopping Japan from doing what it needed to do in Asia. And it uh, also says quite a bit about the, uh, the, the strategy of actually keeping Asia as opposed to the abandoned China strategy that uh, we had uh, preferred in earlier years. So... Without further ado, Chris, I'll hand it to you for your access pr perspective. Okay, so old cricket from the abandoned monitoring station in Dallas, Texas, where I am dominating Wassum again. All right, first of all, props to Young Grasshopper. Uh, a lot of what I did in this game I got from uh, various things on his... Uh, YouTube site, and if you're watching this and you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to go to YouTube immediately and Google Young Grasshopper Axis Allies 1940 and start watching videos. See, it's actually Cliffside Bunker. Well, that will do it too. Cliffside Bunker is the name of his YouTube channel. Okay, here's the thing. Uh, I still am a fan of the Abandoned China strategy. However, I ain't gonna lie, Young Grasshopper's uh, Japan strategy is the bomb. Uh, it's not just the attack on the first turn is Japan that's important, uh, but I think he'll agree with me. You know, the importance of that strategy, number one, is you get to take out this battleship uh, that's down here. You get to wipe out the American Navy and the plane that's there. You immediately put up a blockade you immediately put pressure on the United States. But you kind of look at what you're doing in China when you have a J-1 attack because moving into the Yunnan, even if you don't have enough guys that you want to have, you know, you're going to take some losses, but you got so many planes. Close down the Burma Road, turn one, so that he can't reinforce in there from three to four spots and get a big stack of 12, 14, 15 guys. That's a gnarly mess because that will slow you down. If you can prevent China from stacking up all of their chips and take them down in stacks of two, threes, and fours, or ones and twos up there, you're going to be doing well. I didn't move up uh, into Russia until the mid-game after that was pretty well abandoned. Um, at that point, it was really just a matter of helping Germany out because I took nine IPC away from them just in the Northern Territory, so that's three extra guys to turn. Uh, the other thing about the Axis that I think you've got to do is you've got to coordinate your strategies. You know, in the first Axis game that I flipped the board over because I was pissed when I messed up so many times, uh, I didn't really have a cohesive Axis strategy because I was 
spent most of my time working on my ally strategy since I was allies the first game. Uh, but uh, here, the Japanese uh, attack on turn one obviously brings the U.S. into the war. That has the tendency to put enormous pressure on Europe because the United States is closer to the European theater, can get its units over there faster. Uh, there's more happening there uh, more quickly, and they're in a weaker posture uh, at the start of the game to start plowing through things. So the Toronto raid, devastating if pulled off successfully. So that's why the opening turn for Germany, I bought uh, a carrier to put planes on, moved all of my other planes over to the coast, uh, and two transports so that I had a credible sea uh, line that I could do on turn two if he took all of his planes out. And he has to worry that I'm going to build up seven or eight transports and a bunch of guys and just cripple them up on turn three, uh, take London, roll the line back uh, to preserve the rest until I could flop them over there. So as a result of the immediate pressure on London, he held a plane or two back from the Toronto raid. You know, that was all the difference in the world. you got to bring that German fighter down there to defend so you have a three-plane scramble. Uh, absolutely critical. Uh, and then later in the game, I built a secondary uh, air base there. Never really had to use it, but then again, that was the point, is I had the capacity to put six planes there and six planes scramble to prevent ever losing C-Zone 97. Because if the Allies can get in there and start convoying, they're going to convoy Greece, Albania, Yugoslavia, northern Italy, southern Italy, most expensive piece on the board right there that the Allies can take it. So you absolutely can't let that fall. Uh, so when the Toronto raid fa fall, falters, that puts Italy in a great position. I mean, I had ridiculous rolls. I don't think he killed anything in my opening Navy. So I was able to take Egypt, you know, turn two or three in the game. Even if my Navy was weakened a little bit, I was going to be so strong. I was going to be able to get down there eventually, uh, or I could have pivoted over to the Middle East or I could have started sending guys over there. Now, knowing that Japan is going to bring the U.S. into the war, uh, that has to influence your German buys. I did not buy as many tanks and planes as I usually do early in the game. I bought tons and tons and tons of infantry uh, because there's enough... There, you, you can't buy no tanks or no artillery. you got to buy a few, but you have a lot of that stuff at the beginning of the game. But you got to build massive walls to prevent uh, them from coming in. So there's, you know, a stack of there. That was at 20 at one point. I, I moved a lot of guys out because he's abandoned. That was at 20 at one point. Dent marks at 20. So I mean, I had 50 guys along the coast, plus a reserve force back in Western Germany. Plus I have 50 guys moving up this way and another 20 in Western Germany. So uh, my German game for 12 turns consisted a lot of moving all my guys up, and then he'd block it, and I'd move them all back down to the path of least resistance, and he'd move over, then I'd move him back up. And because I was kept churning out 10 guys, I had a test stack of 10, 11 tanks, I was able to take most of that uh, from him. Your light just went out, why did that happen? I don't know, see the button or something? I don't think so. Anyway. Anyways, I'm almost done. Uh, so anyways, the importance is, uh, make sure that you're coordinating your attacks. Make sure if you're going to bring the U.S. into the war that you're building up lots of infantry. Uh, I'm not sure how to exactly stop the Japanese uh, first turn attack uh, where you can shut down the Burma Road, particularly as well as I rolled. I guess my thought would be don't immediately move those guys back into Europe because there's probably going to be a little bit less pressure there uh, and some other strategies, and you're going to need those guys, uh, if for nothing else, to open up a secondary front. If you see that Japanese first strategy, you know, someone had posted on our abandoned China strategy that they would immediately pour everything into Germany. Probably a good strategy. I think here I'd pour everything into the Pacific because you got to get through the blockade and, uh, almost immediately. And I would consider the Alaskan forward naval strategy and building a factory up in Alaska because that allows you to, uh, you get a factory and you get a naval base there, you immediately put pressure on Japan uh, with your navy down here and your ability to build a navy immediately into Japan, the U.S. can uh, bust up the blockade by making Japan either choose the north or the south. Once they divide up their navy, then they're easy, easy pickings. And with the extra 18 guys there, Alaskan forward naval strategy, pouring boats in the water to come in, put pressure on Japan immediately, 
try slowing them up a little bit with India, maybe take a couple of these islands, maybe Anzac takes an island even at the cost of a transport early on. Whatever you can do to tripwire up Japan so that you have enough turns to uh, break the blockade and get on the coast and start putting pressure on uh, all of these territories. Because as Young Grasshopper said in one of his videos, a rich Japan is a happy Japan. And I was oh so happy this game. So that's six uh, victories for the good guys. Uh, one for Brian, which I'm a little embarrassed about, but I'll try to rectify that by beating him twice next year. Oh, that's two total to be. Well, the first game don't clear. count. Sure. I mean, sure. we're not going to count that one. All right. All right. The record, I think, seems clear. I am still dominating Lawson. Awesome.